And now I'd like to present our uh, speaker today, Professor Julia Novi Hildesley. Julia Novi Hildesley is Professor of the Practice and Executive Director of Stanford's Change Leadership for Sustainability Program. This includes the Leadership for Sustainability Executive Education Program, as well as a Sustainability Science and Practice Interdisciplinary Master's degree. With 20 years experience leading nonprofit and philanthropic organizations, Julia's research and teaching focuses on business strategies, leadership, approaches, and cross-sector partnerships that spur global development and align systems with the goal of intergenerational well-being. The Change Leadership Program explores the mindsets, knowledge, and tools leaders need to accelerate the transition to a more sustainable and resilient society. These include understanding complex systems, leading organizational change, and innovating in complex systems at scale in order to shift suboptimal status quo orientations towards sustainability. And Julia will be talking about some of these themes today throughout the webinar. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Julia. Hello there, and welcome to the webinar. Glad to have you joining us. Um, today, I'm going to cover three core questions and themes. First, why build a sustainable organization? Um, second, what orientations are required to thrive in today's operating environment? And third, how do you integrate sustainability at the core and throughout your organization? So let's start first by um, talking about sustainability and what sustainability means. Um, sustainability is really a term that has often been associated with green concepts um, and doing environmental good. But in fact, if you look at really what sustainability means more broadly, it's a very holistic, systemic um, definition that's important to consider. So for example, economic, social, and environmental factors we hear when business talks about the triple bottom line. Um, the Brundtland Report is the first report that really made an effort in 1987 to define what sustainable development is. And it looked at the interactions between human beings and their natural environment, basically saying that environment is the place where we live and development is what we do um, within that environment. And therefore, sustainable development is thinking about how we go about improving our condition while maintaining the quality of the environment where we live. Another really important thing to remember about sustainability in addition to it being a holistic term incorporating social, economic, and environmental values, is that it is a long-term um, view on development. And it's a very integrated view. So for example, it is not just about some folks doing well um, at the expense of others, um, but it's really about a holistic view of all people doing well. And it's about doing well over time across generations. We often use the term intergenerational well-being to describe what we mean by sustainability. So one can't really understand sustainability without thinking about systems. And um, here in this diagram, you see the economy nested within society and nested within the environment. When you think about systems, you think about complex, nonlinear dynamic interactions that occur between economy, society, and the environment. Jane Jacobs, an urban philosopher, reminds us that the, environment, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment and not the other way around. So um, with this in mind, we have to move a little bit from maybe our more linear, reductive um, approaches to problem solving and thinking and take a more holistic, systemic view. This cartoon shows a group of blind men with an elephant working to understand what they're looking at. And of course, they're all looking at different parts separately and getting fragmented views of what's going on. It's by taking a systems perspective and exchanging information about different parts of the system that they can come to a full understanding. Let's talk about how we hear in business the global environment characterized. VUCA world is a concept that was coined by the US Army War College um, to describe the multilateral world after the Cold War where things were much more in flux. And um, it has been used now since the late 1990s in business to describe the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity of the business operating environment. And really, if you look at some of the root causes of VUCA world, you see that underlying um, these symptoms are the dynamic interactions between social environmental systems and the increasing stress 
we face uh, within those systems, whether from population growth or technology change or um, climate issues and uh, resource scarcity, uh, civic strife or political unrest. These dynamics of the social environmental systems are giving rise to the context we call VUCA. Um, so given um, VUCA is characterized by complexity, let's look a little bit more closely at what differentiates complicated from complex environments or complicated challenges from complex challenges. Complicated challenges are ones where the problem is easily definable, where existing know-how is adequate. You can solve um, the challenge with an existing blueprint or algorithm or procedure. You're in a fairly stable context where outcome is fairly predictable. You can plan for change. Um, and success depends on the blueprint that directs both the development of separate parts and specifies the exact relationship in which to assemble them. So you could think of a Ferrari as a, as a complicated system. You can take the parts, take it all apart, and then um, while it's very, very complex, you can put it back together and the sum is simply equal to, to the, the parts. In a complex environment or challenge, only parts of a problem are definable. Um, expertise helps. Um, in the same way it helps in a complicated challenge, but it has to be uh, balanced with responsiveness because the environment is changing. The context is unstable. Um, the outcome is unpredictable. And this, of course, means that it requires constant adaptation, improvisation, and experimentation. And in this case, you can't really separate the parts from the whole. The essence actually exists in the relationships between the parts. So you could think about a tropical rainforest, for example, where you have all the different species together in dynamic interaction with one another. And if you take it all apart, um, you will um, see that actually the sum is much greater than the individual parts because of the interaction. So the rainforest, for example, produces rain on its own. It recycles nutrients. All of these functions happen um, because of the interaction between the different parts. So here's a little cartoon that maybe expresses our temptation to sometimes look for the simple answers when we are overwhelmed in a VUCA context. Um, and that we are grappling with how best to deal with complexity um, and to find the patterns of navigation that will help us find our way through complexity to the, the visions we hope to achieve. David Snowden in the late 1990s worked to try to help us in this regard. Uh, he developed the Kinevin framework. Kinevin is a word that means habitat in Welsh. And um, you can see at the top left we have environments characterized by complexity. So what this Kinevin framework does is it categorizes different habitats or contexts, and the aim is to help decision makers or managers really um, understand the different contexts they might be in and then apply the right problem-solving um, approaches or strategies based on that context. So if you look at the complex context in the upper left quadrant, what you can see is that um, we need to apply intuitive navigation of changing patterns. We need to look at pattern management um, as a dominant strategy when dealing with complexity. And that, by definition, means a really strong capacity to sense the environment, to perceive patterns, and then to respond and experiment accordingly based on that strong sensing capacity. If we look at natural ecological systems, these systems, like the tropical rainforest, um, have millions of years of experience navigating changing patterns in the context of complexity and change. And um, it's an interesting question to consider whether or not understanding a bit how the organisms uh, within a complex open natural system like the rainforest and the system itself orient um, could perhaps help business and organizations think about how they might orient in the context of change and complexity. So let's look at some of the core orientations of resilient, resilient open natural systems. Um, first of all, they are oriented to connect. They have rich patterns of relationships um, and very much of an interconnected, interdependent um, communication between the different elements. They're also oriented to adapt. 
to evolve and adapt to changing conditions, to be in touch through the sensing capacity of connection um, with what's going on in the environment, and then to adapt accordingly to exploit new niches or to um, evolve to suit a changing condition. And then finally, they're oriented to innovate, to experiment and redesign, um, to identify new ways of um, behaving and designing oneself in the context of a new environment. So when you're thinking about building a sustainable organization, it's both about thinking and placing sustainability at the core with purpose, but also applying the kinds of orientations that really enable an organization to thrive in the context of complexity and change. So um, you can see in this diagram the idea that applying orientations of connect, adapt, and innovate expands the capacity of the organization to have impact through its core purpose. So um, let's talk a little bit about what those orientations might look like in the context of business. So connect, for example, would be about broadening and deepening connections. So broadening one's view, seeing one's connection to the broader context um, and operating environment, and then deepening the connection, say, for example, through one's value chain to have more of a relationship focus rather than a transaction focus to really understand the operations more deeply and build the relationships accordingly. It's about um, seeing the environment in which you're operating from a holistic perspective. Um, and that includes seeing all the connections as well as seeing places maybe where there are disconnections or where the system is broken. Um, ADAPT is really about learning and reorienting to be relevant, being relevant to the changing context. Um, that means seeing um, this fuller understanding of reality that you get by greater connection, and then um, expanding a notion of responsibility because of that um, understanding. So that may mean moving from a focus on shareholders as the dominant and only stakeholder to a much more broad and inclusive view of stakeholders. It may mean moving from a shorter-term focus on financial profitability to a more inclusive, longer-term focus on social, environmental, and economic sustainability. And then in terms of innovate, it's really about thinking creatively about the opportunities presented by the new context and designing and partnering for sustainability. Um, taking some responsibility for the ways in which the system isn't working and um, jumping in and re redesigning systems so that they can work in this new context and aligned with sustainability goals. So in a moment, we're going to talk about a couple of organizations, look at two examples of organizations that have um, put sustainability at the core and applied these orientations to expand the impact um, and profitability of their organizations. But first, um, I'd like to do a quick poll and um, check in with our group here about some of the motivations um, that might be behind your interest and your organization's interest in engaging in sustainability. So. Um, what I'd like to ask you are, what are the main drivers for integrating sustainability into the core purpose of your organization? Um, there's a set of options there to choose from. Um, these are based on the report, the comprehensive report submitted to the Harvard Business Review and published last fall that really look at the academic research and data that um, has been for you know the last couple of decades as to why companies are putting sustainability at the core. Um, I'd be interested to hear what's motivating your organization to do so, to the extent that it is. So we'll pause for a moment, take some answers, and then we'll, um, in a minute or two, be able to report back on the poll. Okay, we'll close the poll. It looks as though um, fostering innovation is one of the leading um, reasons and driving competitive advantage, as well as attracting and engaging employees. That looks like that also received quite a, quite a large number. Uh, but all, all of the choices um, were selected. Okay, great. Thank you. So let's look at a couple of case studies. Um, Unilever, a multinational consumer goods company, which reaches 2 billion customers per day and has over 170,000 employees, and Sustainable Harvest, a um, specialty coffee importer um, that imports about 20 million pounds of coffee per year and is responsible for about one-sixth of the fair trade uh, coffee sold in the United States. So let's look at the orientation that they're applying with sustainability as their core purpose 
and see um, what that actually means as you translate that to business. So first of all, the connect orientation. They are broadening their view, um, looking at the broader context, and also deepening connections. Um, and they're doing this in, in three ways that I'd like to discuss today. One, um, they're situating their organization in the broader context, understanding um, the role they play in that context and how that context might affect them. Second, they're building relationships across their value chain. And third, they're connecting their core purpose um, to the current reality. So they're ensuring an alignment between their, their core purpose and, and the context they're operating in. Um, second, the ADAPT orientation. This is really about learning and reorienting to be relevant. So um, in the first place, they're reorienting goals and strategy. Um, to align with the, the new sustainability orientation and the contextual changes, but they're also putting in place metrics to measure progress. Second, they're aligning culture and incentives. The phrase that culture often trumps strategy is important here in that without a culture that's supportive of this realignment and this learning, um, sustainability strategy will likely not be as effective. And then finally, adopting a learning orientation throughout the organization. Third, um, innovating. I mean, you all selected fostering innovation as one of the core reasons for putting sustainability at the core of your organization. Um, this really is about designing and partnering for sustainability, first through new products and business models, second, um, by engaging broad participation in problem solving, so harnessing a lot more resources dedicated to that innovation. And then finally, forging partnerships, new kinds of partnerships, perhaps with unlikely bedfellows, um, to achieve scaled impact. So let's dig into Unilever a little bit. Um, as you probably know, Unilever is an Anglo-Dutch transnational consumer goods company. Um, it touches 2 billion customers per day. And the CEO, Paul Pullman, um, was, um, began his tenure in 2009 and built on the traditional values of Unilever, but really began a very powerful and focused emphasis on sustainability, focusing on growing and prospering by tackling 21st, challenge, 21st century challenges, actually seeing, as you pointed out in the poll, that by tackling these challenges, innovation and, and therefore productivity growth would, would, encourage, uh, would, would increase. So uh, one of the first things he talked about was taking a systems approach. Um, he said business needs to take more of a systems approach to their operations, seeing companies as part of an interconnected web of, that links multiple players. So this is how he began his approach and foray to thinking about operating a business um, in service of sustainability. So the first um, element of um, situating in broader context aligned with the Connect orientation, Unilever conducted a thorough strategic review. Um, and identified four me um, mega trends that affected its business. The first had to do with um, shifts in markets, the world moving south and east, in other words, um, a strong shift to emerging markets. Um, but then recognizing that within these markets there were constraints related to income and resource scarcity that would have impacts on the business. Second, um, shifts in lifestyles, living differently, um, a big move of um, globally from rural to urban locations, um, which then put the thing into question taxing um, already strained infrastructure with this urban migration. Um, also longer lives, people living longer. All of these had implications for supply chains and um, product and service design. Third, um, the environment under stress, shifts in the natural environment, um, recognizing water scarcity, climate change, deforestation, poor sanitation, that the operating conditions for business were increasingly under stress, which had um, big implications for product development and manufacturing, as well as supply chain security issues. And then finally, the digital revolution, looking at shifts in stakeholder empowerment through access to information and communication technologies, um, in particular, recognizing that citizens were empowered through these technologies required more transparency and stakeholder engagement. And um, that was required um, in order to minimize the reputational risk and the demand for more stringent regulations that business might suffer if it didn't effectively engage these stakeholders. So um, in addition to connecting with the broader context, 
Unilever also has placed a very strong emphasis on connecting um, throughout the value chain. So not just the broader global environment, but then really looking across all of its value chains and thinking about um, the relationships with suppliers and the impact of the product within that value chain. So one step um, Pullman took early on was to ask his managers to work across disciplines to deepen relationships and understanding across the value chain, uh, working with producers and suppliers to understand the environmental impact and social impact of its products. Um, so it conducted a, a life cycle analysis um, of the company's top 13 brands. And um, as you may know, the, a life cycle analysis is a technique that's used to thoroughly assess the environmental impact associated with all stages of a product's life from raw material extraction through materials processing, manufacture, um, distribution, use, repair, and maintenance. So through this um, connection with a broader context, connection with the value chain, um, Unilever really connected with its core purpose and built on founding values since the 1880s, which were around responsible business business developing products that met the needs of the masses and reformulated that core purpose to focus on what they felt was the call um, for Unilever in the 21st century, and that was to make sustainable living commonplace. So um, this is a, an image adapted from Danella Meadows, one of the great system scientists from the 20th century, and she talks about the tension that's created once you've established a clear purpose, in this case making sustainable living commonplace and really understanding your current reality and the importance of really holding both of those creates a, a creative tension that forces realignment and change and progress hopefully towards uh, achieving your purpose. And this um, is where the ADAPT orientation comes in where businesses then need to think about how do they need to change and reorient to achieve this core purpose in the context of um, current reality. Um, Paul Pullman came out and said, we must develop a business model aimed at contributing to society and the environment instead of taking from them. Somehow we need to figure out you know, what this business model can look like that will achieve that. And so they <clears throat> developed a business model that um, situated itself around sustainable living. Basically the idea was that um, profitable volume growth would occur um, through innovations that bring new sustainability benefits to consumers and retailers, that reducing waste and energy um, by thinking about sustainability and looking at life cycle analysis would um, save costs, and that um, risk could be managed um, in the supply chain, which would secure long-term sustainable sourcing of materials and long-term viability of operations. So as, through this business plan, it set out a vision and a series of goals called the Sustainable Living Plan. Um, it was a vision to double the size of their business um, while reducing its environmental footprint and increasing the positive impact, the positive social impact of the business. This was set out in um, 2010 as a 10-year vision for um, profitable and sustainable growth. Within the plan, um, three concrete goals were identified to help more than one billion people to improve their health and well-being by 2020 to have the environmental footprint of Unilever products and um, to source 100% of agricultural raw material sustainably and enhance the livelihoods of millions of people around the value chain. So again, this is back to that expansion, not just of connection, but sense of responsibility um, throughout the value chain. Um, within the Sustainable Living Plan were nine goals, or are nine goals. Um, they center around three areas, the improving health and well-being, reducing environmental impact, and enhancing livelihoods. And of course, goals need metrics uh, to ensure there's progress, and Unilever has been very strong on establishing over 50 targets uh, associated with the goals and then tracking progress and reporting progress against those targets. So in this case, this is the 2014 um, Sustainable Living Plan Summary of Progress. And one you know, example, for example, is the health and hygiene. Um, the goal was to help one billion people improve hygiene habits. By 2014, Unilever had um, reached 397 million people through sanitation, safe drinking water, 
and hand washing campaign. Um, it has also been reporting um, financial and non-financial indicators next to one another um, to also cultivate that awareness among all stakeholders, the board, all the way down to end consumers, that it is tracking both of these things. So here you can see at the top the more traditional financial indicators and below um, non-financial indicators around manufacturing. For example, um, looking at carbon uh, generated and water used per ton of production, waste sent to disposal, um, and also um, issues around employee engagement and diversity that are being tracked. And all this um, is happening in the context of Unilever's share price doing quite well. It's the two red lines there on those two graphs compared to the S&P 500 on the left and the FTSE 100 on the right. Um, so Unilever continues to show positive financial indicators. And um, in 2014, 50% uh, of its growth came from the sustainable living brand. They grew um, at twice the rate of the business, of the other, um, the rest of the business. So um, in addition to aligning goals and metrics with sustainability, um, as we discussed earlier, aligning culture and incentives is, is critical. So in, Unilever has pursued the full integration of the sustainable living plan into its culture. There are two board committees uh, entirely responsible for um, evaluating progress, making recommendations, critiquing um, issues related to the sustainable living plan. Paul Pullman, early on, decided not to issue quarterly reports. He wanted to underscore management's belief that investing in sustainability takes time. And um, remuneration is tied to achieving um, targets associated with the sustainable living plan. So in addition to um, aligning the incentives and the culture, one core aspect of, of culture change is developing a learning orientation. How could Unilever develop a learning organization so that it would not just reorient once, but continue to reorient and adapt as conditions change um, and through a better understanding of its environment? So it um, embarked on quite extensive employee training and development um, endeavors both communicating the core purpose of the institution as well as trying to cultivate growth mindset and other system thinking approaches amongst its employees. Um, it's also really pursued the idea that involving employees is central to helping them understand and feel committed and engaged um, with, with the purpose of the organization. And um, a couple of examples of how it's done that um, include the Dove self-esteem project, where Dove Soap has been associated with the opportunity to educate girls between the ages of 8 and 17 on um, the beauty comes from within and help combat some of the issues that young women are facing in terms of body image. Employees have been very involved in um, rolling out those campaigns in diverse countries. And similarly, um, Help a Child Reach 5 campaign is a campaign that has been um, teaching children and their parents about the importance of hand washing and how to do it effectively. And employees have been very engaged in participating in those training programs as well. Learning from stakeholders is another key uh, aspect of adopting a learning orientation. So not just building your own capacity within the organization to learn, but thinking about how you learn from diverse um, stakeholders, bringing as many ideas to the table for um, innovation. So um, Unilever, is one example is Unilever established the um, Sustainable Living Lab, which was a scaled approach to stakeholder engagement where it engaged over 2,000 um, stakeholders from 70 countries in a 24-hour live dialogue to critique and reflect on progress um, within the Sustainable Living Plan thus far and to gain new ideas for how to make better progress. So moving to an adapt, uh, innovate orientation, once the organization is reoriented and is aligning culture and, and, and learning with um, sustainability, how can it then move to a platform of innovation? So um, one of the things that Unilever has put a lot of emphasis on is designing new products and business models that tackle sustainability challenges. The sunlight and light buoy soaps are, are two great examples. Light buoy soap in particular, um, 
is one you can see the children's hands turning green there. They designed this soap so that it would turn green once children had washed their hands long enough to eliminate 99.9% .9 of germs. They also used it um, redesigned the formulation so that it was a foam wash, so it was more relevant to places with water scarcity. It requires a third less water um, because it's a, a foam a soap. And then finally, um, by doing research on the germs that uh, cause cholera and typhoid and eye and skin infections, the most significant causes of infant mortality in a number of the regions where they work, they reformulated um, the actual chemical composition of the soap to be 10 times more effective at killing those particular germs. And then, as you saw in the prior slide, launching campaigns to, to really help educate consumers uh, both in terms of issues of water scarcity, but also in terms of the benefits of hand washing for um, sustainability and livelihood. Um, circular economy um, is another area where Unilever has, has innovated. They are um, taking the traditional model of take, make, waste, which is, you know, take products from the environment, uh, take resources from the natural environment, make products, use them for a limited period of time, and then dispose of them to thinking much more in a circular way, in the same way that natural systems uh, pursue a circular approach to um, waste, where all waste is recycled and reused by the system. So um, Unilever has um, incentivized groups throughout its supply chain um, to think about circular economy opportunities. And some ideas include using um, tea bags for um, wallpaper. Um, they've gotten um, plastic laminate that used to go into landfills could be now used um, for school desks, uh, mayonnaise turning into to biofuel. So a lot of creativity happening um, in their journey to zero waste. Um, the other thing that they're doing is designing and partnering for sustainability um, by engaging broad participation in problem solving. They have employee incentive programs that they've used to fund projects globally um, that are having a significant impact on carbon reduction. They are also crowdsourcing sustainability through the innovation um, Unilever Foundry. It's an open innovation platform. And um, Unilever posts challenges and op it opens it up to global participation and collaboration. Finally, um, Unilever has been a leader in terms of working with um, unlikely bedfellows and partnering for sustainability. Back in the late 1990s, um, Unilever formed a partnership with World Wildlife Fund, the global conservation organization, to launch the Marine Stewardship Council, a certification and eco-labeling um, organization that would help create economic incentives for sustainable fishing by certifying those fisheries with good practice and allowing products from those fisheries to bear an eco-label. It also is more recently working with the Tropical Forest Alliance, a group of governments and um, consumer goods companies who are dedicating to eliminating deforestation entirely from the supply chain of consumer goods companies and figuring out strategies to um, address that challenge. So let's turn briefly to Sustainable Harvest, a second company, um, a specialty coffee importer that sells certified specialty coffee from about 18 countries, approximately 20 million pounds, imported each year, um, and as I mentioned, a sixth of certified U.S. Fair Trade coffee. Sustainable Harvest uh, started in um, the late 1980s when its founder, Dave Griswold, was volunteering in Mexico uh, for a coffee um, organization that supported farmers and met Pedro, a farmer who came and represented 40 families and, and handed Dave a bag of coffee and said, this is really good coffee. I come from Nayarit, the state in Mexico, and we need help finding a way to sell our coffee. Can you help us? And um, so what um, Dave did is he thought about what this meant, the fact that there was such a disconnect in the global market where farmers were producing coffee, but they had no idea how to access the global market. Um, they were just selling on local exchanges. Nor did the global market have any sense of connection to, to farmers and actually the potential source of, of great quality coffee. So he decided to form an organization dedicated to making this connection and making the market work in favor of smallholder coffee farmers. Um, he looked at the global operating environment, um, recognized the market shocks, low commodity prices, climate change, and industry consolidation that coffee farmers were facing. Um, and he invented a new business model. He decided to go from a more traditional linear supply chain model to a much more circular 
value chain. So um, he coined this relationship coffee. And the idea was that there would be full transparency across the value chain, that all producers um, would have access to full information, as would everyone involved in every step of the value chain. So all um, prices and costs were, were made transparent and shared. But more importantly, relationships were built um, between those individuals so that sector-wide issues could be discussed and solutions could be found. He um, coined the purpose of the organization as helping farmers move from subsistence to sustainability. So thinking about really taking, having an impact on some of the 25 million smallholder coffee farmers who are struggling with subsistence and moving them to a, a viable business, a sustainable business model. Um, one of the steps he did to reorient his company in addition, which is already quite strongly founded on social, economic, and environmental um, vision, was to become a B corporation or a benefit corporation um, in 2008 and hold the organization accountable to a series of metrics that um, B corporations are accountable to. These corporations are um, approved to be, and in fact required to be, if you get a B corporation status, to be dedicated to social, environmental, and financial impact. And then they are monitored accordingly. And sustainable harvest, as you can see on this grid, um, performs quite well even relative to other B corporations. Um, a second step he took was to align culture and incentive. So to really think about um, all the different aspects of compensation, hiring practices, transparency, and connection to farmers. So as one example, compensation, the most highly compensated employee in his company is uh, a ratio of five to one to the lowest comp compensated employee in the United States. Um, hiring practices, quite interesting. He hires for system thinkers, not coffee specialists. He looks to people who have shown interest in other cultures, speak another language, and think um, in an integrative way. Then he teaches them core skills around the coffee industry. In terms of a learning orientation, one of the primary ways um, sustainable harvest has developed its learning is through an event that they've run now for several years called Let's Talk Coffee. It's an event that's held in most usually in a coffee growing country, and it brings together all of the members of the value chain to talk about upcoming issues. What are the issues they're not on top of that they anticipate coming down the pipe for the coffee industry? What are producers struggling with? What are the needs of roasters? How do they problem solve together, and how do they anticipate future challenges? In addition, a lot of deals get done at Let's Talk Coffee as roasters meet producers and, and get to know their particular coffees and stories. Um, but most importantly, it's an opportunity to really problem solve um, and continue to learn together. Innovation. Um, one of the ways in which sustainable harvest innovates is through new products and services. Tasteify on the left is a, a product that they designed that's won several awards for innovation that really does for coffee what we have um, for wine, which is a way of rating wines and sharing information between producers and um, retailers of, of that product. Question Coffee is a new brand that they developed to help, um, to help um, farmers really work directly with um, buyers, customers, so linking farmers directly um, to customers and helping them understand what the issues are that farmers are facing and helping educate consumers about questioning um, the coffee supply chain. And finally, they've had a huge emphasis on um, farmer training and technology. The company plows back 90% of gross revenues into farmer training and um, support, including the prices paid for the coffee uh, purchased from farmers. Technologies include water saving technology uh, for coffee processing, but also really high-tech strategies for thinking about how to um, understand the last mile of coffee production, where you can look at individual farmer plots and see how they um, connect to particular coffees that are produced and, and understand the profile of the coffees from, from a very micro scale on individual plots. Um, through Let's Talk Coffee and other platforms um, and the deep relationships they've built through their relationship coffee model, they've been able to engage broad participation in problem solving. So when um, the Roya crisis broke out in 2013, 
um, a fungus that was dramatically affecting um, coffee plants in Central America in particular. Uh, sustainable Harvest was positioned to both um, perceive the problem very quickly because it has um, very regular visits to its producers on the ground through its origin offices, these offices based in countries of origin where the coffee is grown. So they were able to perceive the problem quickly and through their relationships leverage scientists and agronomists to really figure out what were the best approaches for uh, averting the spread of the disease, um, addressing plants that were already diseased, um, educating farmers so that they would know um, the trade-offs between different approaches like the use of fungicides or not. Um, and they convened several Let's Talk Roya events where they brought different stakeholders together, provided training kits to farmers, responded to questions, even brought in lenders to help consider how to assist the farmers with multi-year loans for replanting a number of their um, farms that had been so, so badly damaged. Um, and then similar to Unilever working creatively with diverse partnerships, Sustainable Harvest has done the same. They, um, in addition to working with certifiers to um, validate and third party certify their fair trade and ecologically um, sustainably grown coffee and Root Capital, one of the lenders they work with, um, they formed a major partnership with Bloomberg to um, use philanthropic capital to reach uh, tens of thousands of Rwandan women who are displaced and who, for whom coffee growing is a wonderful opportunity for building a sustainable livelihood. So through these programs um, of training and support, Rwandan women have been able to not just cultivate coffee but cultivate premium quality coffee and reach, um, reach consumers directly. So as we think about these examples and what it means for building a sustainable organization, um, we have lots of data in terms of the Harvard Business Review report that summarizes recent academic research um, and business experience related to why, you know, what the business case is for integrating sustainability at the core. And we've got global moves by groups of CEOs to uh, think about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, for example, the 17 goals that the United Nations has put forward. Um, as our goals of a global community to achieve sustainable development. And you now have CEOs articulating the $12 trillion opportunity that those goals present. Um, so what does this mean for, for your business? It's about reflecting on how your pur pur purpose might align with sustainability and then thinking about how to use orientations that will help drive you towards progress um, both in terms of achieving and maximizing the impact of your purpose and thriving in the context of a highly complex and changing environment. I think Paul Pullman um, sums it up best when he says, we are at a turning point in history, a point where we all need to change for human life on the planet to continue to prosper. A new business model with sustainability at its heart is vital for quality of life around the globe to improve. Only the businesses that grasp this will survive only those who grow sustainably will thrive. So I'm looking forward to your thoughts, and we can take a few questions. But first, I'm going to turn it over to Roni Shilo, who will um, give you a bit of information about our upcoming enrollment program. Thank you very much, Julia. This was extremely interesting, and I think also inspiring to think to, to all of us listening to the webinar to think about how we might be able to look differently at the organizations that we work in and contribute to a more sustainable society. Uh, over time. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Julia and we'll, we'll engage in a few questions that we'll be taking. Again, we'll answer as many questions as we can in the short time that we have. Uh, and a reminder that the recording of the webinar will be sent to all of you who have been uh, on the line with us today so that you can review the material again. Um, so Julia, one question that has come in um, has to do with the relationship, difference, and similarities between corporate sustain, uh, 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 corporate responsibility, CSR, and, uh, and sustainability, and how you see that uh, connection. Great question, um, and I think it is quite different. Corporate sustainability, of course, there's a whole range and spectrum, so one mustn't oversimplify, but corporate social responsibility can often not be linked to core purpose of the organization. So it could be, for example, the donation of products associated with that business to people who need them, computers to classrooms or backpacks with particular products to children in different schools. Um, 
sustainability at the core is quite different. It means that you're basically putting sustainability as core to your strategy um, and designing your entire business model and strategy around sustainability objectives. So really looking at how, um, you know, back to, you know, connecting with your environment and understanding it, building relationships in your value chain, understanding the social and environmental impacts of your, your production processes and your products, um, reorienting your whole um, system so that it aligns with the goal of sustainability, which means um, taking significant action internally to track different kinds of metrics, and, um, and that's obviously at, at one extreme, but in an innovating, of course, for sustainability where you're looking at new business models like the circular economy or collaborative consumption, um, new ways of creating uh, sustainable sourcing and sustainable value chains so that it is fully permeated throughout your organization. Um, so you've given examples of two uh, kind of for-profit companies that have been tackling this challenge of sustainability. What are some ways that you've seen nonprofit and uh, government organizations engage in this type of activity? Well, there's been a big um, shift, I would say, in the last 20 years to really sort of blur the lines between the different sectors of society. I think we think of you know, government is providing some basic services, civil society being sort of the watchdog of industry and industry being there to maximize profits. And I think what we're starting to see is that in the modern context with the kinds of challenges that we're facing in the 21st century, stakeholders are working kind of around a new social compact where business, government, and civil society need to find collaborative models for working together to solve complex challenges. I think that the Tropical Forest Alliance is a great example where, you know, governments of countries that are suffering from significant deforestation. Indonesia, for example, uh, losing a lot of tropical rainforest because of palm oil production um, has a lot at stake in thinking, you know, getting businesses who are driving that deforestation to think differently. And then the businesses who are competitors who are, are growing palm oil have a lot at stake at working together because if one business says, hey, we'll take um, deforestation out of our supply chain, but the other competitors don't, they will certainly lose competitive advantage, at least in the short term. So, this collaboration between competitors within business, engaging governments, um, and then also civil society organizations who often have a lot of scientific um, and community knowledge in terms of how to um, make change are really essential. Great. Um, so we've had a number of questions come up around metrics and measuring um, success. I think you've shared a number of examples from Unilever, Unilever on how they measure both their financial impact as well as their uh, sustainability uh, or environmental impact. What can you, uh, can, do you have other examples from other uh, companies or what, what should somebody think about as they're designing some metrics for their organization? Well, I think first is doing a thorough, you know, having a thorough understanding of what the impacts are, um, and of course having a clear understanding of what your what your goals are, and then designing custom metrics accordingly. But certainly the templates that are out there, I think the B Corporation template is is a great template. It looks at all the you know environmental, social, and government governance factors. So um, human rights is becoming a stronger and stronger issue now, um, and most certifications don't actually. Um, address that yet. So businesses that are kind of at the forefront, back to kind of perceiving changes in the environment and anticipating and responding, they are perceiving that human rights is becoming a bigger and bigger issue, um, slave labor and other labor rights issues. And so they are already proactively tackling those, even though the sort of systems and metric and measurement tools are not yet in place. Sustainable Harvest, for example, developed its own system where it um, uses its staff at the origin offices to go and conduct surveys of producer groups to identify whether or not there are any issues related to, to slave labor. Um, it's not yet third party certified, but it's at least one indicator to sustainable harvest if there are problems and issues there. So it's part looking at the models that are out there and then it's part anticipating and perceiving what are becoming current concerns and then designing your own tools that suit your own industry. Great. Um, another question that came up had to do with geographies. So are there particular geographies where you see more energy and activity around this or where this is perhaps more required um, or is this more of a global uh, level activity? That's a very good question. Um, I mean, of course, there are different drivers in different regions, but um, if you look at I, the developing world, um, 
economic terms called emerging markets. I like to consider it, you know, more developing countries. Um, there are a lot of challenges that are being faced there in terms of resource scarcity, um, moves from rural to urban um, environments, and the stress that places on already strained infrastructure. And so there are tremendous opportunities for innovation there. And one thing Unilever has recognized, um, and, and other major companies has recognized that if they don't use their um, bases in these countries to, to innovate in response to these incredible challenges. There are plenty of local competitors emerging who are taking on those challenges and innovating. So in a sense, they have to reorient that way and, and build their local capacity to um, innovate in response to some of these challenges. In terms of sustainability demand from consumers, there certainly is a lot more in the United States and Europe that's driving a lot of the um, quest for products that can be certified as sustainable. So it really depends where you look, but again, taking a systems perspective, these are global challenges, and the key is to then orient um, based on where you have impact to align with the sustainability challenges and goals. All right, so we are, thank you very much, Julie. We're at the top of the hour, so um, uh, we do not have time for additional questions, but this, I, hopefully you all have enjoyed the webinar and the information that has been presented as much as I have. Um, I'd like to encourage all of you again to visit our website, globalimpact.stanford.edu, and find out more information about the program that we'll be offering in September, and hopefully uh, some and or many of you can join us there. Um, and uh, we will also have additional webinars, and we'll be sending along information um, on, on upcoming webinars on this topic. Uh, so with that, I uh, wish you all a good rest of your day, and look out for the recording of the webinar, which should be coming to you within the week. Have a great day, everyone.